All right, so today we're here. Um, we're doing our case study, Microplastics in the Marine Environment. Um, I hope you guys had a chance to watch these films. We'll talk about them in just in a, in a few, but I hope you guys had a chance to watch them. Uh, there's some readings and there's some plastic field trips for you. I, I definitely recommend taking a peek at one of the plastic uh, field trips because uh, you really sort of get to see some, uh, you know, real life videos of sort of the realities of, of, of plastics in the environment. And they're, they're really, really well done by my colleagues. So definitely take a peek at them. Um, uh, from there, uh, you have Wednesday for yourself um, on that. I recommend that you do the lab that I'll discuss in a moment. And then we'll talk about global climate change on Friday, which will be a lengthy one. Uh, you know, buckle up. It's going to be a it's going to be a it's going to be a doozy because it's a big, big topic. Um, and then from there, you know, you have a last podcast discussion board due uh, the 11, uh, 16th. And then you have the, this final lab due uh, the 16th of August, which because we're apparently in August already, which thought. <laughs> and then your final exam is uh, Friday the 8th. So uh, I've had a lot of questions about the uh, Backyard Biodiversity Lab. So I just want to talk about that one really quick, um, just because I think a lot of um, a lot of sort of it's, did I not open it up? A lot of sort of the questions I think stem from just like the wording of it. So um, let's talk about it. Now, it's uh, designed to get you out and about um, so, but it's a pretty straightforward lab. You draw a transect, right? It doesn't have to be precise. You know, the, the activity recommends a 50 foot transect by uh, about six feet wide. It doesn't have to be super precise. You could pace it off with your feet. If you haven't done it already, your foot, unless you have teeny tiny feet, uh, is about a foot long. So it's not super duper precise, uh, but the idea is to get you looking at the ground. Now, one of the things that people oftentimes have difficulty with this slab is how do I define a species? And it's super duper not qualitative, quantitative at all. It's very, very qualitative what you would particularly as an individual would consider to be a species. So if you look at a blade of grass, it looks different from another blade of grass. It's probably a fair bet to call that its own species. That's sort of the most common thing people ask me is how do I define species? Well, you can't. It's um, really hard just to just to let you, just let you know, uh, as someone that's spent many, many times poring over insect specimens over the years, identifying a species is pretty damn hard. So don't worry about trying to be super precise. You're getting gross estimates of it. So don't worry um, about your camera being off, friend. Uh, but don't worry about being super precise with it. And so what you're doing at that data over the transect is, again, you're just trying to accumulate, uh, accumulate, um, aggregate there, that's the word I was looking for, your data and your partners or many partners data um, into essentially a uh, sort of an overall um, data set. Now you're gonna create a call a, a, a chart very much like this where you have the species name and it could be gross, right? I can have a species name is dark green grass or I can have a light green grass or maybe you know oaks. And then I have a pine, right? It's it's really, really that straightforward. You don't need to be super scientific about it. You don't even have to look it up if you, you know, just say it's a tree, right? And then you get to the question, okay, how many do I have? Well, the trees are a bit easier. The insects that you find, you could just say, you know, simply like, oh, it's a, it's a red ant, it's a black ant, it's some sort of beetle, it's a fly, whatever it is you find, maybe it's a centipede, millipede, I don't know. There's lots of fun stuff out there. Um, one thing I should should have mentioned, and I, and I, uh, I, um, I neglected to, because uh, I don't know if anyone's actually not in New England. I'm sure many of you aren't in New England, but if you aren't in New England and you were doing this lab, you'd want to be a little bit careful, you know, because there's there's dangerous things out there. Uh, so you want to get about how many there are. Now for the grass, you just kind of make an estimate, right? You're not trying to get an actual number because that would take you a long time, right? You have to go through and count each individual. That's just crazy. Only scientists do that and you guys are not crazy scientists, so don't do that. So if you're, say, doing your backyard and you do your transect, you can make an estimate that there's 10,000 pieces of grass, 1,000 pieces of grass. I'm not going to check it because I can't, right? <laughs> so make an estimate based on what you think, what you think is going to be the accurate count. So that gives you how many. Then the proportion, uh, or PI, P sub I is NI, so this column A divided by total, um, uh, the total, I should say, like for instance, and total of A, like IE down here. So if, if I had a total of 10,000 here and I pretend I had 50 here, my number here would be 50 divided by 10,000. 
that's what you're getting at. So this number is actually kind of an interesting number. Um, it doesn't quite like say it, you know, in words, but uh, well, it, it sort of dances around the idea uh, of it, but it's really what we could actually call species evenness. Um, and so how even something is really gets at column B here, um, just as a note. Um, so play, it's, it's kind of a funky thing, but like a community of organisms that's very, very even, there's equal numbers of each organism, right? If I have 100 beetles, 100 flies, 100 pieces of grass, it's a completely even community. It would be basically a one. And then a completely uneven community, it would be like 99% is one thing, and then all the other stuff is in very, very low abundance. So that's another common question I get for this lab. <clears throat> what is evenness? It's column B. Get it? How, do, how, do you, how, does, how does the proportion of each individual differ? Right? So for instance, if I have 10,000 species here, and this guy is 999 uh, out of 10,000, well, his proportion is, is greater than 0.99, right? Right, so it's he's this community is inherently very uneven. That's what it's getting at. Um, column C, you take the natural log. Um, I'm sure that's, I think it's just LN, right? In Excel, I, I don't know. Don't use Excel enough to know that. And then you calculate these two, two uh, diversity indexes, uh, Simpson and Shannon diversity. They're both two sides of the same coin. Um, they're beginning at diversity by incorporating both the abundance and the amount of individuals. Remember, that's species richness. And so what they really get at is the bigger the number, the more species, the more species rich your thing is. That's really what it's getting at. More biodiversity you have. It's kind of an easy thing. But again, they are more informative because they distill down all this information, not just how many species, but also species evenness into a nice little what we technically call a diversity index, but that's really not uh, something you would care about. Uh, and so you have these two tables, uh, one from your close to the house site, one away from your house site. Um, <clears throat> and then you're going to calculate uh, these two tables where you have uh, the whoever your person is. So if, if it's just you, you know, we'd have person one, and then you'd have your data, and then we'd have person two, and then you have your data, and for both of these. And then once you have these, you can really start to make some comparisons and start to answer these questions. Do you see any differences? Why might that be? Right? Maybe your person one in your group lives in, in Canada, and they live up you know, where it's cold in Canada which is a large part of Canada, or maybe someone else lives in the desert, right? So you can think, okay, maybe there's diversity differences between these two sites uh, simply because of the weather or the climate, or maybe this person lives in the city. Maybe this person lives in the suburbs. You can ask any number of questions, any number of sort of ideas, I'm not looking for perfect answers because, you know, the reality is you don't really know, right? You're just trying to make some uneducated guesses as to why this might be. And then you sort of just go through and thinking about what, what what what's what's going on with these species? Right? What what are what's you know why it's what's driving the difference between suburban or I should say impacted versus non-impacted? Right. That sort of gets back to our last lecture together where we saw biodiversity was impacted at the urban scale, right, due to human influences. So in theory, close to your house should be not so fun for the organisms. Far away from your house should be significantly better for the organisms. And I I can attest to that. My deck, not lots of not lots of things living on my deck, but back in the woods, there's lots of things. In the woods. And then you're going to look at uh, this final question, which is the most abundant uh, in each group set. And basically you're gonna do some research on their biology. What do they do? It doesn't have to be super, super precise. Just some gross stuff of what they do. If it's a grass, hey, this is what grasses do, right? They provide shelter, they provide food, they provide uh, erosion protection, all that stuff, because grasses are sort of multifaceted. Um, and then you can think of maybe it's an oak tree. Well, an oak tree provides habitat, it provides food, it provides shelter, right? It provides uh, sunlight, uh, you know, blocking of sunlight, it provides dead stuff for organisms. And so you're just trying to get some ideas of what these most important things are doing. And that really should tell you why they're so abundant. I mean, if you think about a forest, why are trees so abundant? Well, pretty much everything depends on trees in a forest, right? For either food, shelter, or some other some other function that these trees are producing. So that sort of the big questions I normally encounter. Did I not sort of get um, any other questions from you guys? Um, did I not cover anything that was on anyone's mind? Um, I just have a quick question about like the Simpson versus Shannon numbers, mm -hmm. because when we were doing the lab, I saw that it showed like more diversity for two of like the sites, according to the Shannon number, but 
it said the opposite for the Simpson one. So I was, I don't really know why. Um, and if we should go off of the Simpson one at all or just use the Shannon number. I mean, from a strict mathematical perspective, the Shannon index is better. And it's actually from a biological perspective, it's the most accurate of okay. the two. Um, so I have no problem with using the Shannon. Though, if you think about sort of the math that goes into it, right? PI, mm -hmm. we have PI gets squared. Now, if the proportion is, is funky, right? The evenness is weird. That's gonna affect the Simpson index, right? Yeah. But this one, we take the natural log of it, which, you know, does mathematically things to it, and then multiplies it strictly by a PI. So they do mathematically slightly different things. So, okay. Um, so stick with uh, the one. Yeah. Uh, okay. You did not have to work in a group, Amber. You could work alone if that's what you're doing. But does that answer your question, Samantha? Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. There. It's um. I'm, it's a good sort of point you brought up. But um, you know, if you guys were, uh, if this was like a like an ecology class um, for biology students, we would dive into more about that, but great question, um, but you know, sort of beyond the scope of this lab. I really sort of get you guys to think about, you know, what, what are the impacts of humans on biodiversity, right? And it's not just like I built a city, right? It's not like here's New York City or I drained, I drained the Florida Everglades, right? It's my house versus the woods behind my house, right? How do I, as an individual, change these things? The other thing I was gonna have you guys do instead, which would have creeped some of you out, is actually to search your own houses, which is really easy to find lots of living stuff. So, but I chose to do the close to your house versus that. I don't want you guys to get creeped out by all the spiders you're gonna find. You had a question, Nicholas? Um, yes, I had uh, two. One, I just wanted to confirm for number seven, um, we were talking about the video where we do the Vermont pond and Bentley pond, correct? So when I asked about uh, species evenness for both ponds, or I didn't know if we were like going to say species evenness for like, if we meant natural versus You know what I mean? Um, oh, I put ponds. Oh my goodness. I forgot to change that word. It's not supposed to say ponds. It's it supposed meant, to say transects. Like natural. Shoot. Yeah, yeah, it's natural versus, I am so sorry. I use the same lab uh, when you guys are in person. We look at the ponds on Bentley's campus. Um, the, you know, the one I saw, that's- uh, I assumed it was from the video, you know, from the Bentley pond and the Vermont pond, but I was like, I feel like it would make more sense for it to be natural versus unnatural. You're good. You're and, absolutely yeah. right. That's just that's just a typo on my hand. I, I try to adapt the lab for you guys to do at home and I just forgot one thing. So if you, if you um, for instance, if you already turned your things and I haven't looked at who turned their things in, if you, you know, you did that, don't worry about it. If you try to answer it based upon the ponds at Bentley or the video about the ponds, don't worry, you're fine. You're not going to lose any points. Okay. So just to let you guys know. Thank you. But, um, I know uh, no. like I probably will have other questions. I'm just trying to see if I wrote them down. Um, yeah, no, I mean, the other thing is, again, like it's fine, I guess, for like us to assume that there's going to be more in our backyards than in the natural sites, correct? Like, would that be an okay hypothesis if that's what we assume? Well, and you could results make, did show that. You could make that assumption. Um, it's not a bad assumption to make. There's lots of cool research out there. Um, I have some friends at Clark University out in Worcester, Mass, who um, do the effects of, of suburbanization. So like that suburban crawl mm -hmm. on biodiversity. And they actually find that suburban lawns and gardens actually increase biodiversity relative to natural areas because we bring in so many exotic yeah. species with us. So it's actually a pretty good, pretty good thing. Um, you didn't know you were, you're getting at a profound thing that people have been looking at for years. So just kind of a cool thing. No, I mean, I, I saw in the, again, in the background, it, it talked about that and I thought it was interesting. And then I, when I was looking at it, I was like, I, I mean, I was like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, yeah. And so I went with that. And when I did the results, it actually came out for that. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Uh, it's a good, you know, if anything else, Oh yeah, I was gonna say if anything, like if I, because I think I might have other questions, but if anything, I'll I'll ask you like after sure, whatever. Definitely. Yeah, uh, you know, we sort oh, of yeah. talked about the importance of biodiversity, and and you know, one of the things that I didn't really get into is this um, introduced by we we talked about exotic species, but we didn't really talk about like this introduced biodiversity idea where you know bringing in plants from other places, even if it's in the same region, um, not necessarily is a is a good thing, right? Natural natural mm. flowers are way better than artificial flowers, right? I mean, hydrangeas look great, but they're not natural to Massachusetts, right? And so they don't bring the same pollinators with them as say wildflowers in Massachusetts would be, so. Yeah. 
no, I yeah, I assumed in the long term it's probably not good, but anyways, yeah, that was pretty much what it's gonna ask. Thank you. Okay. Anybody have any more biodiversity, backyard biodiversity questions? Did you guys uh did you guys enjoy the lab? Getting uh getting dirty. Uh, you had a question, Ann? Uh so how do I do a question five if I work on my own, Professor? I suppose you can't. Any large species diversity? You can't just you can't, right? You can uh, just, I mean, you're gonna answer this question. Um, I mean, you really can't, right? Since you're only doing it by yourself. So it's not really a question you can answer. So you can just write that you work by yourself. Oh, okay, thank you. Easy enough. All right. So, uh, yep. Uh, hi, Professor Kent. Like, is there any formula we need to follow to when we measure the richness? No, richness just refers to how many, right? Oh, so just okay. so just count. <laughs> okay, okay. But bust out those kindergarten skills and count. On, no, I'm just kidding. Just count, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah, counting is a very useful skill. So, um, okay. If anyone has any more questions, All right. just want to just touch on our next lab, which is actually this one. It's really straightforward. Um, so. Uh, you have a documentary, it's available on YouTube for you. Um, it's called The Disappearing Meal, Mail. And so I gave you two documentaries to watch. One you can find on Netflix. I've been trying to find a link to it. It's called uh, Plastic Ocean. You can find it on Netflix. I can't find a, like a link on the internet that works to give you guys. Um, so if you don't have Netflix, don't worry. Um, or if you can borrow Netflix, that's great. But uh, don't worry. Uh, we're gonna talk about mostly ocean plastic stuff today. So um, don't worry. Uh, this Disappearing Meal, it's um, it's a good documentary, um, scientifically speaking. Uh, it feels like it was shot in the 70s. I don't know if you guys got that, if any of you watched it or you got that impression, but I always got that impression when I was watching it. So, uh, But it does tackle the metal, medical aspect of plastics. And uh, it's actually medical problems of plastics are becoming more and more common. So um, you have this documentary. It's about 44 minutes long. Uh, it's pretty dang good. You have um, some questions to answer about it. So. For instance, this, work, this is a worksheet down here at the end of this document. Uh, definitely, uh, while well, you have the documentary running, if you haven't done already, uh, definitely just answer the question. You know, like, oh, it'll tell you exactly how much has the sperm count decreased. You know, what has the World Health Organization done to, to classify uh, healthy sperm? Um, it's an interesting thing. The World Health Organization, um, I'm sure you guys will see in the documentary, but they actually push back the definition of what sterility is and health sperm, healthy sperm is because of how much we're declining in sperm quality, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, but you have some questions to answer on the documentary. Uh, again, pretty much a very medical look at it. Uh, the next thing you have is just a little, little fun little experiment. So we're gonna, it's uh, tackling um, bioaccumulation. We'll talk about that today. Um, I have two questions. You can work with this, your lab group. Yes, you can do the worksheet with your lab group. Yep, it's it's a uh, it's a lab, so it's you know it's outside of your exams. Everything you do as a group, I guess. I guess the podcast discussions, but that's the matter. Um, and this is a pretty cool one. Uh, it's a really great sort of showing, really great uh, job at showing you how it works, um, how bioaccumulation works. Which again, we'll talk about today. But the idea is you mix, you you have water. You add some oil to it, and you guys probably know, you add oil to water, they separate, right? That's just intrinsic properties of water and oil. That's just what they do. Um, now, you can add iodine, which really, in this case, really simulates um, a, uh, you know, essentially a, a toxin. In this case, that's sort of what it's getting at. And so you can sort of add the iodine, make some initial observations, and then shake it up, mix it up. And, and that idea is that shaking it up or mixing it up really gets at um, what's happening um, when an organism ingests a toxin. That's really what it's getting at, when it comes in contact with tissue. And so in this case, the analogy is the tissue is going to be like your fatty tissue. Uh, the iodine will be like a toxin and the water will just be like water because you're just a big bag of water. And you mix them all together. And what happens to the toxin in relationship to the oil, i.e. your tissue? So you get to kind of do this little fun experiment. Um, to sort of show you and really illustrate how a toxin can be incorporated directly into your fatty tissue and become toxic. So it's, I think it's pretty cool. Um, most people have olive oil or vegetable oil. Uh, you don't have to use fancy oil or anything. 
Um, you can just use like regular little garden variety oil. Um, you will have to purchase iodine unless you have iodine at your house. Most people don't. It's not a really common chemical. Um, it can be, it doesn't have to be like pure iodine. It, there's, there's all sorts of um, like iodine um, like compounds, like you'll see betadine and, and stuff. Like you'll see all sorts of different iodine stuff. It just needs to have iodine in it. So if it's not pure iodine, don't worry about it. And don't break the bank. Don't buy a fancy bottle of it. If, if you, if you, you know, just buy like a, like for instance, when I was at Target the other day, I saw one for three bucks, you know, three bucks. So um, again, don't buy fancy iodine. No. You can, you can buy lab grade iodine on Amazon and it's very expensive, but so don't, don't do that. <laughs> you can buy lots of cool lab stuff on Amazon in case you, you didn't know. Um, and so you can buy cheap iodine, do the experiment. Uh, just one person in your group needs to do it. Um, it gives you some volumes here. It doesn't have to be exact volumes. You just need to do it. Um, it's pretty straightforward. And you sort of, you sort of um, get an idea of what's, what's going on. And then the final thing is just some math. Um, and the math um, is pretty straightforward. So you have these five, uh, sorry, yeah, five different organisms here. You have their lifetime accumulation of PCBs. Um, these are just harmful chemicals, polychlorinated uh, bisphenols. So just really common, uh, um, really common um, synthetic plastic, um, um, non-naturally occurring things, really commonly leached out into the environment as we'll talk about today. And this first column is how much they sort of individually just suck in through the environment as they live in the ocean. This is how much the zooplankton just passively takes up. This is how much the phytoplankton passively takes up, the orca, the salmon, and so on and so forth. You'll notice that as they get larger, they accumulate more and more and more over time. Um, just as a note, bigger you are, more surface area, more likely you are to just absorb bad things. Just the way it is. Uh, and we have it in this units. If you guys have never seen PPB before, it's parts per billion. So if I had a billion things, say I had a billion marbles, if I have something that was one parts per billion, I'd have of those marbles, one would be, say, um, I don't know, a green marble and the rest of them are red marbles. That's what parts per billion gets at. Uh, so it's a very, very small amount. But as you probably saw with the documentary, and as we'll talk about today, a little bit of this stuff goes a long way. Then you have this other column is how much they eat over their lifetime. So in this case of the orca, it eats 1,000 herring and 500 salmon, which probably isn't accurate, but that's what we have. We have 1,000 herring are eaten by the salmon, and then so on and so forth. Now, how do you go about doing this, the total lifetime accumulation? Well, you have to factor in two things. What is that organism eating, and what is it passively absorbing from the environment? So we could do the first two together, just to sure show you. We look at the phytoplankton, it eats nothing because it's photosynthetic, it's basically the tree, right? Just photosynthesizes. And so it passively accumulates two parts per billion over its lifetime. It's pretty straightforward. Then we step up, we have the zooplankton, which you see it passively absorbs two parts per billion, which is great. And then you'll see it eats 100 zooplankton. Now, what do I do with that number? Well, I simply take that 100 and multiply it by this number here. Right, that two parts per billion. So I get 100 times two, giving me 200 parts per billion. And then I have to obviously add two parts per billion to that, giving me a grand total of 202 parts per billion. And you kind of just go up the table there, right? So sort of see the math that I did here, two parts per billion, that's what it absorbs over its lifetime. It eats 100 phytoplankton, but we see the phytoplankton absorbs two parts per billion over its lifetime. So we have to factor that in. Right. If it's eating 100 phytoplankton, that means it's consuming all the things that the phytoplankton have absorbed over their lifetime. And you'll notice as this, you sort of do this math, right? If I have a 10,000 here, it takes 10,000 zooplankton to feed a single heron. Well, we have to multiply 10,000 by this big number. So we start getting bigger. And then we step up, we get bigger and bigger and bigger. And we do this in sort of the context of humans, eventually it gets to humans where it's really, really high. So. It's kind of funky. It's very, very simple math. You know, I'm sure you guys are well versed in your in your multiplication. Um, but that's what you're getting at, right? You want to factor in what it absorbs and how much it's eating in its diet. And then once you do that, you have some questions to answer uh, about it as well. Um, and that's the lab. It's pretty. I, I think it's a pretty cool lab. Um, at least I, I think it is. Um, <laughs> I, I, I've never tried this with Bentley students before. So let me know what you guys think about the lab and certainly let me know what you think about the documentary. Um, I'd like to know what you guys think. I, I think they're pretty cool, but maybe that's just a big swing and then swing and a miss on my end. I don't, I don't know. So, but uh, you have a couple of weeks to do this. 
Um, tackle it. If you have any questions along the way, I think the co most common people, people have problems is actually in this math. So if you're having trouble with anything, but I, I feel like likely it'll be in this table, just let me know. Happy to answer any questions that you um, need answered. So, all right. So there's that. So uh, does anybody have any questions before we hop in? All right, so uh, I pulled my uh, screen away just to show you my face, not because you need to see my face, but actually just because I need to use a prop for today. And it's not like a cool prop um, um, at all. Um, it's, just a, it's just a credit card and you can't see my numbers on the back, but you see I have my, my little Discover card here. Um, you might ask yourself, why am I showing my Discover card? It's not because I want to I want to flash my wealth, right? I mean, I don't really get paid a lot. So I'm um, certainly not flashing any wealth here by showing you my my sweet tie-dye Discover card. And the numbers are on the back, so you're, you're fresh out of luck if you're trying to use my card order pizza or something more expensive. Now, I show you this card, again, not for any reason other than it relates to today's class. Now, this card is made out of plastic. Plastic. Plastic, plastic, plastic. You look around your house, you look around your room, you look at what you have in front of you. It's plastic, 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 plastic. Everything has got plastic in it, even if you don't think it has plastic in it. I have these, these little napkins in front of me um, because I'm sitting at my kitchen table. They have plastic in them. They don't look like they have plastic, but they have plastic, 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 plastic. So I give you my Discover card here. Why? Well, this Discover card aptly represents about the amount of plastic that your average everyday American, and this is average over 300 million people, 350 million people, consumes on a weekly basis. And you might think to yourself, there's no way I eat this much plastic. There's no way I don't know this, this, this much plastic in when I eat and drink. 350 million people were all consuming about this much plastic every single week. So that's a lot of plastic. So that's some food for thought. Um, and again, a great, a great sort of example of what we're sort of talking about today. Plastic, plastic, plastic. So let's dive in. And so we're gonna talk about plastic today. Um, and we're gonna do it through the context of the ocean. Now, uh, your documentary sort of gets at the medical aspect and, and that's great. And, um, and fun and all, and, and it's really beyond my expertise as a as you know someone that's interested um, in plastics, but is environmentally focused. So it's the documentary works kind of great for me. So I don't have to talk too much about medicine because I'm not super knowledgeable about medicine. Um, but we're going to focus on the plastic ocean, and we're going to focus on it for two reasons. Um, one, it's just it's in the news all the time. When we talk about plastics and the problem of plastics, it's almost universally talked about as an oceanic problem. Um, but the second reason we're talking about it is actually in complete opposition to that first statement is because it's not just an oceanic problem. It doesn't matter where you go. And, it, and I, I truly mean that. It doesn't matter where you, oh, I jumped the gun. Uh, it doesn't matter where you go. You go into the ocean, you go into our soils, you go into our forests, you go anywhere, there's plastic. Now, the final thing I'll say before we sort of dive on is uh, just actually a story uh, from my own personal life. And it's not like I did something cool or anything like that. I don't, I don't think I've told you guys a story about any cool thing that I've ever done, which there's not, there's not a ton of those. Um, <laughs> uh, is when I, was, when I was younger, I used to really like those survival shows. Um, I don't know if you guys watch like Man vs. Wild or like uh, Survivor Man or, or any of those Survivor shows. I really like those for whatever reason. Uh, I just, they just really like sort of like, they're really cool to me. Um, and it wasn't just because like Bear Grylls, you know, in Man vs. Wild was drinking his own pee and eating gross stuff. I just really like the idea of like, you know, like survival. I don't, I don't know, just maybe it just calls my, my, inner, uh, my inner caveman or something. I don't, I don't know. But I really like those shows. And one of the things that about those shows that I always thought was absolutely crazy is that these people, these guys would go to these, these islands in the middle of the ocean. They would go to these remote forests. They would go all these crazy places all over the planet. And no matter where these guys went, they would find plastic. And that always has stuck with me. And I always tell my students that story because again, it's never left my brain that you could go to this pristine island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, 5,000 miles away from civilization and there's plastic and there's trash. And so it's just really an amazing thing. So that's sort of the setting for this today's class is plastic, but I wanted to show off some pictures of my dog 
um, from this past fall. Um, I haven't showed these to people yet because um, I don't know. I just want to show these because these are really cute. You see a little chippy boy before he tore his ACL, bobbing for apples, and then trying to eat an apple hole because that's just the kind of man that he is. So I wanted to show you those. He's he's pretty damn cute. He's this is when he was going to daycare before he tore his ACL like a crazy man. So happy pictures before the set. So <clears throat> we're going to start off actually with a quote from John Caterano. I can't remember if he's still the uh, CEO of Nestle. I can't remember. CEOs, I feel like they turn over really fast. So he could probably be not, the, he could probably be the CEO of someplace else for all I know. Um, and he had this really great quote. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Caterano said, the water bottle has in some ways become the mink coats for the pack of cigarettes. It is socially not very acceptable to the young folks. And that scares me. And if you think about what Nestle's business model is, I mean, that Nestle is invested in a lot of different things, right? They have chocolate, they have all sorts of different things, but the bread and butter, what really brought Nestle lots of money and still brings them crap tons of money is their water business. They go to places, it can be as simple as like they go to Lake Michigan and they draw, or maybe someplace remote in Asia and they draw water from these natural resources, clean it up a little bit, bottle it, <laughs> and they sell it. Actually, sometimes, funny enough, some of these places actually bottle tap water and they sell that as bottled water, which I always thought was kind of funny. But they bottle this water and they sell it. So they take a commodity, which is free. Um, you know, you can just, you, you can go out and get water anywhere, right? It's water's everywhere, right? We live in a, an aquatic planet, right? And they sell it and they make lots of money for it. And when we think about sort of the changing of tones, it's actually kind of an interesting thing to a business model such as Nestle's or even a business model such as Coke's that so heavily depends on the plastic water bottle. And, and I, think, I think the generational divide really does a great job at illustrating this where we can look at my generation and your generation and we're far more environmentally conscious by and large, not all of us obviously, but we look at a plastic water bottle, we say, no, I don't I really want to use that. I want to use a reusable bottle. Right? I want to get my water. I want to go to the fountain where it counts how many bottles it's saved. I want to get my water from there. And then you sort of contrast that to my mom's generation, right? So she's a, she's born in 1955. So tail end of the baby boomer, baby, baby boomer generation. And my mom loves bottled water. And so much so that my mom keeps not just one, but two 24 packs of water in the backs of our car at all points in time. My mom loves plastic bottled water. And that's pretty dang reflective of most of our generation. They love plastic water. But we think about that generational divide, right, as baby booners and Gen X start to sort of fade and our, my generation, your generation really start to take hold, a business model such as Nestle's that depends so heavily on that really kind of should and does really scare them. So I think this quote does a really great job at two things, showing how important plastic is to business models, but also showing the generational divide, right, between the two. So it's a pretty cool um, quote um, by a not so fun company. Um, Nestle's at the top of my list of companies I do not like. But let's dive in. Let's talk about marine life. Now, as of today's class, or actually as of the semester, when I put these slides onto Blackboard, about 700 marine species are negatively affected by oceanic plastics. It is awful as seeing someone pull a plastic straw out of a turtle's nose with a piece of pliers, a salmon being essentially cut in half, or at least its head chopped off by plastic wrap. And I mean, like, just like plastic wrap, or a seal trapped in discarded fishing gear. And there's hundreds and thousands of pictures like this on the internet you can just find just google animals stuck in plastic and the google search is like astronomically high it's you know as as all google searches are actually but this one in particular is lots and lots of researches and that's not you know we look at these and we see these are awful but it gets worse right we can see you know this Picture, these picture from National Geographic and the World Wildlife Foundation, where we see a seal essentially just trapped in a plastic bag. It saw that plastic bag. It thought it was food. It went after it, but it got ensnared in plastic. Or we can see a sperm whale here, right? As we talked about, most marine mammals are endangered, and the sperm whale is no exception to that, um, that, that statement. And you can see its, its stomach. It's dead, obviously. It's decomposing. But you can see its stomach is ruptured. Um, and we can look at what's in the stomach of this organism, and it's plastic. You can see coffee cups, right? It's probably a Dunkin' Donuts cup or something, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and plates and plastic bags and all this trash. And you might ask yourself, how, how, how does this happen, right? How does, how does this happen? 
Well, the reality is when we look at scenarios like this and like this, well, sometimes it's just food, right? When a sperm whale, which is relatively predatory, sees things that look like food, it tries to eat them. It's not that they're stupid. It's just that they're hungry, right? They see things that look like food. And when you're a big giant organism like a sperm whale, you need a lot of food. So if something looks like food, they're going to try to eat it, even if it ends up being a, plas- a, a, a dish, right? Or a Dunkin' Donuts cup, right? So sometimes they're eating it because they think it's food, but other times they actually just eat it on accident. They're going to say, eat a bunch of phytoplankton and they just pick up a bunch of plastic that's surrounding the phytoplankton. And so there's lots of ways plastic gets into our marine environment. Um, sorry, um, into our marine organisms and harms our marine organisms. And again, the, the, the pictures look as grotesque as this whale's stomach to as heartbreaking as these sorts of scenarios here. Um, and these are the species that we know of. I'm sure every marine species out there is affected by plastic in some way, shape, or form. So that's the sort of the backdrop. Plastic affects our organisms, and it's doing it indiscriminately, big and large and small. It doesn't really matter. Everything is being affected. Now, let's talk plastic by the numbers. How much plastic do we produce? And unsurprisingly, it is astronomically high. 300 million tons of plastic are created annually, 300 million tons. That is, for lack of a better word, a crap load of plastic, right? It is an immense amount of plastic. It is, it is so, so much. Now, of that plastic, 50% is what we define as single use. Now you might ask yourself, what does single use mean? Well, say you're, go- say you're thirsty, you're out um, you know, shopping for the day and you go and you say, oh, that tasty bottle of Coke looks great. So I'm gonna go to that store. I'm gonna buy that bottle of Coke. You know, It's in the Coke plastic bottle. You drink your Coke because you're so thirsty and you take that plastic bottle and you throw it away without ever using it again. That's what single use means. So there's lots of things that are encompassed in single use and we'll get to that. But just to know that of all the plastic that we create on an annual basis, 50% is simply use once and throw it in the trash which is a lot. Now, of that, about, you know, about five to 10%, depending on the year, depending on the location. Uh, so about 10 to 20 million tons um, is estimated to enter the, the oceans every year, um, every year. So a huge amount of plastic, millions and millions of tons every year, make it into the ocean. Now, where does, how does most of that plastic get into the ocean? You might sit to yourself and think, well, most of it's probably from like cruise ships and fishermen. But the reality of it is only about 20% of the plastic in the ocean makes it into the ocean via something that's already on the ocean, right? Via a boat or something like that. 80% of all oceanic plastic makes it into the ocean. Um, I'm sorry, 80% of the plastic that makes it into the ocean comes from the land. So it's just people's waste that you're generating. Interestingly enough, um, you can actually look at when most plastic enters the ocean. It's actually during the summer. So between May May and October, October, Uh, about, um, what is it, like 65% of all plastic makes it into the ocean from the land. And that's pretty clear as to why it's the summer. People are outside doing fun stuff, right? People are more active. So we produce more waste, thus more waste makes it into the ocean. And how does that oceanic plastic get into the ocean from the land? It's really a nice one word answer. It's just rivers. Rivers dump plastic into the ocean. And as we discussed in the water um, class, all rivers eventually some way, shape or form lead to the ocean and humans love to live by rivers. And so let's talk about rivers. So let's look at the top, um, uh, um, the, the, the top largest uh, river, uh, I'm sorry, top 20 river sources of plastic to the oceans. There we go. Um, and we have, you know, their, their, their lower mass input of, of, of tons per year and their upper estimate. So how much are they putting into the ocean per year? And it's pretty staggering. You see, you know, the Yangtze River and the Ganges River, both in Asia, uh, put a staggering amount, 10 to the 5 tons per year. Um, so it's a pretty high amount. And then we have all these different rivers. And you'll notice most of them are spread um, pretty heavily uh, across both Africa and Asia. And the reality is that actually most of our plastics that come into the ocean actually come from Asia and Africa. Um, there's, there's, there seems to be some interesting sociological reasons why that is. We won't get into that. Um, but certainly... Um, Lots of plastic comes from from our our friends over in Asia, with China leading the way, um, not closely followed by the by Indonesia and the Philippines, Vietnam, and you see some some African countries, Egypt, 
um, Nigeria, uh, Algeria, and so on and so forth, um, contributing to this. So lots of plastic coming from Asia, as well as our friends in China. And then you see the United States rounds out this actual top 20 list here, being number 20, which is actually good <laughs> um, You know that we're not number one in something. Um, though I will say the United States is the number one producer of plastic waste globally. We just do a better job of not letting it get into rivers, which ultimately make it into the ocean. So again, we're not, we're, we're, we're producing lots of plastic waste, but we're doing a slightly better job than most other places, right? The, you know, we're, we're down at low, you know, um, the, the, you know, in the, we're still in the top 20. So we're not doing great, but we're doing better. So now most plastics make it via rivers. And a lot of that comes from, you know, just like it's trash that makes it into the rivers, but there's lots of other areas and sources of micro of plastics, as well as what we'll define as microplastics, which is simply microscopic pieces of plastic. And we'll get in the technical definition of a microplastic in just a moment. Now, agricultural runoff is a big deal. Um, it puts lots and lots of tiny pieces of plastic into our soils, into our rivers, which again, make it to the oceans. Aquaculture, so uh, you know, growing organisms in a confined space or just catching organisms from the ocean. It's a pretty big deal. Uh, cruise ships like to dump stuff either on purpose, accidentally, or their passengers do it. Uh, common way plastics get into the ocean. Oceanic dumping, you know, by uh, barges, things like that, or sometimes on accident, um, happen to put plastics to the ocean. Uh, too much stormwater runoff. So really, really uh, big storm waters from like big, uh, say, like tropical storms are really common. Uh, ways plastic makes it into the ocean. Uh, shipping and fishing industries, they have their hands all sorts of dirty on putting plastics in the ocean. Urban runoff, so like, you know, say there's like a, a rainstorm and it uh, washes stuff from Boston into Boston Harbor. That's what urban runoff is. And then finally, and probably the biggest sort of thing, and we'll talk about waste management more in, in a subsequent class, but just poor waste management. How we handle our waste is really what's defining how much plastic makes it out there. And I just want to sort of show you uh, just an example of this, because uh, this was, um, wasn't, I wouldn't say big news, but it certainly got a lot of people angry a couple of years ago. And so in 2018, the, um, the Carnival Corporation, so you guys, you guys probably heard of Carnival, right? They're the, you know, the cruise ship people. They have those monster um, ships, like monster, like entire cities big. <laughs> like they're, you, know, you guys have probably seen those cruise ships. They're monsters. Uh, Carnival has a, a storied history of, of, putting plastic into the ocean and putting trash and food waste into the ocean. Um, and they actually got fined about $20 million um, after pleading guilty to releasing food and plastic waste into the, off the coast of the Bahamas. Now, you might look at that and say, wow, that's a big fine. <laughs> and um, sure, $20 million is a lot of cash for your average everyday person. That's more than most of us will make in our lifetime. However, that $20 million fine represents only about 0.1% of $18.8 .8 billion that they, had in, that they had in gross revenue for the entire year of 2018. So it was a fraction of their cost of doing business. Now, you might ask yourself, why does Carnival do this? Well, the reality is disposal of waste, as we'll talk about, is expensive. And so if you can save some money by dumping into the ocean and potentially paying a fine, you probably save quite a bit of money. A lot of polluters factor in fines such as these small ones into the equation because it's simply the cost of doing business, which is a horrible thing to say, but it's sort of the reality of sort of the system we, the economic system we have in place right now, which is kind of a bummer. Now, I've, I've sort of made mention of this when we talked about air pollution, but I really think this, this sort of fine on Carnival really illustrates it, right? Fines simply aren't enough, right? Fines are for people who can't afford them, right? Fine, parking, a parking fine deters someone that that say makes minimum wage, right? Because an extra 50 or hundred dollars or several hundred dollars is a big detriment. But this would be like finding you a penny for calling me a jackass in class, right? <laughs> it's nothing. So fines simply aren't enough to deter this type of penalty. Again, it's really the cost of doing business from lots of places. So we have quantities, we have sources. What are the common pieces of plastic we find out there? Well. You'd be surprised, maybe you won't be surprised, but uh, maybe you'll be surprised to, le to learn that um, of all those plastics that comprise our lovely plastic problem, the vast majority, if not all of them, are single use items. And so they include things that you might think of, right? Plastics like bottles and the lids, plastic shopping bags, food wrappers and containers, cups, plates, forks, right? Things like that. 
Those are a huge constituent, but the largest piece of plastic pollution out there is actually cigarette butts. You might, you might think to yourself, well, how is that the case? Well, the reality is, and we'll talk about this more in a, in a few moments, is that plastic even is even in places you don't think it is. And cigarette butts are a great example of that. People like to think that they're paper and things like that. No, they are, they are about 65% plastic. So plastic is found everywhere, but just to know that most of the plastic that makes up this top 10 list is single use. And you might not, and, and you might not think of it as a plastic problem, right? You might not think of cigarettes as a plastic problem. You might not think of paper bags, which people like to say is a healthier alternative or not a healthier, a better or more environmentally friendly alternative to the plastic bag also has plastic in it. It's kind of a stark thing. Um, and even something like a beverage can, right? A, a can of Coke, right? It has a plastic lining. So plastic is, re single use plastic is a really big problem, but the reality is it's in places you might not think of. And we'll talk about another source of that, of where you might not think of it plastic in just a moment. But I wanna just make, sort of take a moment now to talk about what happens to plastic when it makes it into the environment. How long does it hang around for? And the key takeaway from this is it's a crap ton of time, right? You think about something like a plastic water bottle, 450 years, fishing line, 600 years, uh, cigarette butts, one to five years, glass bottles, really, really long time, disposable papers, 450, disposable diapers, 450 years. And the list goes on and on and on. You can Google lists of these things and they are astronomically high, right? astronomically high. Now, to put this into more perspective, um, if, the, if the, um, the pilgrims, when they came over here on the Mayflower, you know, you, got, you guys know that story, I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, if they had plastic with them, you know, back in the 1600s, if they had plastic with them, they had a plastic water bottle and they were drinking from plastic water bottles and they threw those plastic water bottles into the forest here in New England or maybe down in Virginia or whatever, those plastic water bottles would still be there today. That's how long plastic hangs around for. It hangs around forever. And I say forever because this chart is actually of how long it takes to break down. Now, there's, a, there's, there's an important distinction to make here. Plastic breaks down. It does not decompose. It breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces till you can no longer see it. But the plastic itself never goes away. And again, that's breakdown. It does not decompose. Decompose is like I'm at my office. I eat a banana. And I throw my banana peel in the trash, eventually that banana peel will completely disappear because something has eaten it. But plastic simply doesn't do that. If you throw a bottle onto the shore, like the, say the pilgrims did it, it's just going to hang around, even if it's, you can't see it anymore. So it breaks down. It just simply doesn't decompose. It never goes away. Yep. You had a question? Yeah. I'm not sure if this is like a real thing or not, but I think I saw somewhere that scientists like created a bacteria that was like made to eat plastic, is that true? It is true. I was actually gonna mention that at the end of class. Um, uh, there are, so there are, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a little bit of it later too, but there are been genetically engineered bacteria because um, plastic is really hard. You guys, you guys know that already. It's, you know, plastic is, can be super duper hard. Um, so it's hard for organisms to eat it. And so there's all sorts of organisms that we've taken and engineered with various metabolic pathways to break down plastics. So yeah, you're absolutely right. There's some cool bacteria and some cool fungi um, that have been um, discovered and engineered to actually break down plastic. There's also been some pretty cool um, uh, worms, um, uh, insect larvae that they've uh, found will actually break down and eat plastics as well. So there's all sorts of cool science um, out there, but uh, that was a really great question. Uh, guys, guys always seem to jump the gun on me. I'm gonna tell you something, I'm gonna like, feel like I'm gonna drop something cool on you guys and you're like, oh, it's what about this? And you're, you spoiled my thing, but uh, great question. Now, um, as I mentioned, plastics don't decompose, right? My sandwich decomposes. My plastic bottle, my plastic that my sandwich is in, it's never going to go away. And that's kind of, the, kind of the wild thing about it, right? We think about, you know, like things breaking down and we have to throw them away, but plastic just is kind of going to hang around. Just, I don't know, I always thought it was a really remarkable thing. Now, um, how does plastic break down? Now, the primary way by which plastic breaks down is a process called photodegradation. The sun's rays, you know, they, for those of you that are pale skin like me, you know, the sun rays are, are just a pile of jerks. They burn you, they hurt you, right? They're no friend to plastics either. They, they, they heat plastic up, they cause plastics to fracture, to break, and they break apart. That's the primary way by which, by which plastics break down into smaller pieces is our, our lovely friend, the sun. Um, 
but wind action as well as waves also help to break down plastics as well. Water, you know, I'm sure you guys have probably seen like a uh, sea glass, for instance, right? Or maybe rocks in the ocean. They're nice and smooth. Uh, why are they nice and smooth? Well, they get tossed and turned by the waves, uh, by the wind, things like that. Same thing happens to plastics, causing them to break down. Now, plastics break down and eventually they become so small, less than five millimeters in size, and we define them as microplastics. So they can break down naturally. However, we also produce lots and lots of microplastics that are used in manufacturing. So for instance, so for those of you that have ever used an abrasive skin wash or ever used toothpaste, I, I hope you guys have all used toothpaste in your life <laughs> at this point, anything that's like abrasive um, is usually plastic in origin. And so you commonly see plastics in toothpastes and, and facial care products. It's everywhere. And sometimes it's not like deliberately put in there to be abrasive. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, sometimes just plastics are just added. Another common thing we see is actually um, microfibers that are added to clothing. Um, plastic microfibers are commonly added. Um, you'll see them commonly in nylon as well as polyester, as well as propylene, um, polypropylene clothing. So you might think like yoga pants. Those are pretty common things. Uh, track, you know, gym shorts, um, swish, swishy pants, you know, the Adidas ones that go. All those things have plastic in them, right? So, but one of the things, the plastics that they have in them is these microfibers. They're synthetically created fibers. They're really, really tiny, as you can see here, right? This fiber itself, very, very small. It's, you know, maybe like, uh, you know, five millimeters long. Um, it's just made for the manufacturing process of producing these things. So we have plastics, microplastics that are made intentionally, but plastics have to break down, again, wind, wave, sun. Now you can sort of see this plastic. So we have a zooplankton here, just a copepod, your little, little tiny little guys. Uh, you can see its body, you know, its, its digestive system goes from front to back. And you can see these, these fluorescent green pieces here. These are simply microplastics. This organism saw the microplastics, thought they were food and ate them. I mean, they weren't green, but, you know, they look like food, so it ate them, right? Very much like we saw with the sperm whale earlier. And then we can also see a rainbow runner, um, just a species of fish. And we can see this, this rainbow runner um, in this picture from my colleague had actually 18 pieces of ingested plastic inside of it. And you might see, well, why did you eat the plastic? Well, in this case, it was probably not accidental. They probably ate them on purpose because, again, it looks like food. It really does. It looks like food. This looks like a little insect to these, these, these organisms that have really bad eyesight. We look at them and say, oh, that's definitely plastic, but it's like, ooh, tasty treat. And you can imagine like if you eat enough of this stuff, it will clog up your stomach, right? Just think about like, you know, like if you eat like, um, a, like a, a plate of plastic, you might eventually think, well, maybe that plastic won't be able to pass through my, from my stomach into my colon. Or my or small intestine, I should say. And that's what happens with a lot of these organisms. It just, they get so much plastic that it simply can't pass through their digestive system and it eventually kills them. Um, if you have a, a tummy full of plastic, you simply can't get enough nutrients, which is a weird thing to think about for humans. But for a fish, it's certainly a reality. It's a certain reality for birds as well. So those are plastics. It's really, um, really sort of two areas. They, they start off large or they break and they break down or they started off very, very small. But either way, lots and lots of tiny pieces of plastic are out there. And the reality is plastics, again, are in places you might not think, right? So com, you know, plastics make it into your lotions. They're added on purpose to help make lotions absorb better. Um, and those plastics go somewhere. When you, when you put lotion on your hand, where are those plastics goes that are in your lotion? They go right into your hands. So plastics have to go some way, somewhere. So that's our plastics. Now, in the marine environment, plastics are everywhere. However, they are unsurprisingly heavily, heavily concentrated in coastal environments, heavily. So you, I'm sure you guys have probably seen pictures of beaches like this. Um, this is not just unique to, you know, to, to places in Africa or places in, in, in Asia. This happens in the United States too. There are beaches that look like this. And why are there lots of plastics by the ocean? And in the, in, I'm sorry, in the close part of the ocean, the, you know, the coastal environments? Well, just because people live near the coastal environment, right? Rivers dump into coastal environments. They dump their water, right? So plastics inherently are more commonly found near the ocean. But the reality is plastic is found everywhere in the ocean from the top of the ocean 
to the bottom of the ocean. And I really mean that. And so I'm sure you guys have all probably heard of the Mariana Trench at some point in your life, or maybe you haven't, and this is the first time you're learning about it, which is kind of an exciting thing because the Mariana Trench is absolutely insane. Now, the Mariana Trench is one of the many trenches out there in the ocean, just really, really deep parts of the ocean. The Mariana Trench happens to be the deepest part at about 11 kilometers down. So, you know, you're, you're looking at eight miles in that ballpark. It is really, really deep. You know, it, it is super duper deep, the deepest part of our ocean. And the reality is when they do deep ocean expeditions down there, they find plastic, whether it's pieces of plastic, a part of buoys, or if it's fishing gear or plastic bags. And, and you can sort of see this crab here hanging out on the plastic in the trash. And so plastics are everywhere in our ocean. They might be more abundant in coastal environments, but they are certainly found everywhere, which is really crazy when you think about it. And it really sort of goes back to that story I told you about the crazy survivor guys, right? They find plastic on these remote islands because again, plastic gets everywhere. And as we discussed in the, in, the, in the water class, once something gets into the ocean, it gets circulated around the entire ocean through oceanic currents. So plastic doesn't go anywhere, but gets circulated relatively easily. Now, I'm sure those pictures have conveyed the seriousness of plastics on marine life. It clogs up their stomachs, it uh, traps them, right? It suffocates them. So marine life is clearly not having a fun time with plastic, but what other problems does plastics pose to marine life? Well, one of the common things we see are what we call POPs or persistent organic compounds. They actually commonly stick to plastics. Now you might think, what's, what's a POP? Well, POP is just anything that is organic in nature. Anything that are, is organic in nature is inherently more toxic to marine life. So classifications of POPs include things like PCBs, so plasticizers, they make plastic uh, harder, better, things like that, as well as heavy metals. They readily like to bind to our friend the plastic. And you guys probably know heavy metals, if you ingest enough of them, are no good. And we'll talk about a case of heavy metal poisoning when we talk about waste in a few classes. We have our friend bisphenol A. I hope you guys, um, for those of you that, that watch the documentary, you recognize, recognize bisphenol A or BPA as um, the culprit to, uh, behind that documentary. Um, but BPA is a really cool um, compound because it was originally researched back in the 20s, if I'm not mistaken, as a way, as a synthetic estrogen, uh, and synthetic hormone. But BPA actually mimics estrogen and has some known cancer-causing properties to it. BPA loves to stick to plastic. It's plastic's best friend, just as a note. Uh, pharmaceuticals love to stick to plastics. It can be something as simple as caffeine, uh, acetaminophen, i.e. Tylenol, or something like synthetic estrogen. They love plastic. Our pesticides, which we use, and we'll talk about later in the semester, which we use in droves across the United States, loves plastics as well. And flame retardants, such as those as asbestos, also love to stick to plastic. So lots of stuff that is very toxic likes to stick to plastic. And if those things like to stick to plastic, anything that eats plastic will intake those things. So if, I've, if I have, a, 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 say, this fish back here, oh, I went too far, this fish back here, and it eats a bunch of plastic, and all that plastic has a bunch of heavy metals to it, the heavy metals might actually just poison the fish and kill the fish. So sometimes it's not just the plastic that kills it, but sometimes the things that are stuck to the plastic. Now, the other things we actually see um, is the effects of these pops and con the consumption of plastics on marine life. And so the common things we see is actually the reduction in food consumption by many, very, by many, many fish, including those that are commercially viable, such as our friends here, the mussel, trout, uh, uh, ba you know, bass, you know, sea bass, uh, swordfish, things of the like. Things that eat plastic and eat a lot of plastic simply consume less and they also grow less. Um, I can't remember the exact number off the top of my head, but Mike, but plastics are estimated to cost billions of dollars to the, to the fishing industry every year due to decreased body size of farmed and wild caught individuals. So it's an economic problem as well, just, just as a note. Now, because they can mimic hormones, they actually reduce offspring. Um, vi and um, so you saw, you'll see this in the documentary. Um, you see it, it pretty dramatically affects sexual reproduction because a lot of these things mimic hormones such as BPA. So if you affect hormones, you affect reproduction. Uh, they cause physical damage as I showed, as I showed you with the, at the picture of the sperm whale. Its, stom its stomach basically you know, was, was full of plastic causing internal damage, causing inflammation, causing all sorts of bad side effects. Um, it can reduce the growth so we get smaller species. And the other thing which your lab gets at, 
but also the documentary gets at as well, is actually what it does is biomagnifies. And so you do that, you're going to fill out that table as part of your lab, and you're going to do some calculations about what biomagnification is, but let's talk about what biomagnification actually means. So when we talk about biomagnification, it simply refers to um, how things build up in the food chain over time. So we have a hypothetical food chain here where we have phytoplankton, which are consumed by zooplankton, which are consumed by herring, which are consumed by salmon, which are then consumed by orcas. As you'll notice, these are the same five organisms as part of your exercise for your lab. I wonder who made that up. Hint, it was me. <laughs> um, so it's, it's a nice little thing. Now, we have this hypothetical scenario where we have a home um, and a factory and roads leaking harmful toxic chemicals. In this case, it's PCBs, so plastic compounds um, into the ocean. Now, as we discussed, organisms passively absorb these over their lifetime just through their skin and things like that. So the, the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, and so on and so forth will just readily absorb these into their body. But the other thing is things like to eat other things, right? That's what the food chain is. And so we think about our lovely phytoplankton here. They're absorbing those from the environment and they're small. They don't absorb very much phytoplankton, as you'll see from that exercise. And so it doesn't really harm them all that much. It might harm them a little bit, but not a ton. So they're okay. So they, they absorb and they're doing their phytoplankton thing, but eventually they become food for our, our lovely zooplankton here. Um, and they, the zooplankton, they're big. And they have to eat a lot of stuff below them, right? Hundreds of, of, of phytoplankton for each zooplankton. So as those zooplankton eat more and more and more of that toxin, they're more likely to, I'm sorry, of the, of the phytoplankton, they're more likely to absorb and store more of this toxic PCB. So I hope you can sort of see where this is going. Then we have the herring, which eats a lot of zooplankton. So it's absorbing a lot of that toxin. And then you have the salmon, which has to eat a lot of herring. So thus it's absorbing more and more toxins. And by the time we get to our beloved orca here, um, it's eating lots and lots of salmon, lots and lots of other things. And it's absorbing lots of these chemicals. So what's happening is that we have a very low concentration at the bottom of the food, food chain here. And as we work our way up, things become more and more and more concentrated as we go up the food chain. Now, you might think of, well, how do humans factor into this food chain? Well, remember, we fish at high, we eat at high levels, right? When we eat wild organisms, we eat big fish, right? We eat swordfish, we eat salmon, we eat uh, striped bass, we eat big, big organisms because we're big, right? And so we eat big things and big things have lots of toxins in them. So you guys are, weren't born for this, but the big thing in the 90s, uh, when I was a kid, and I, I, rem I will never not remember this because I remember my mom got so freaked out by it, um, was actually um, uh, our, our uh, mercury-infused tuna. So one of the common things we were seeing in tuna, that in our cans, of course, was that they had high levels of mercury in them. Now, mercury, as we'll talk about in the few, uh, later in the semester, depending on the form, is very, very toxic. And so people were all worried about mercury and tuna, but how did the lot of mercury make it into the tuna? Well, it made it into the tuna because of this biomagnification idea, where as we go up the food chain, the toxins get more and more concentrated. Um, and the final thing I'll say about this slide is um, you want to make sure you know this. I always ask a question about biomagnification on my exam, just to let you know. So, you know, nice little... Uh, little tip for, for, uh, for, for the people watching this live. So definitely remember how this works. You'll get some practice calculating it. And I hope that makes it a little bit more clear if this was unclear. Uh, but if you have any questions about this, definitely let me know. Because again, I always ask about it because it's really low fruit, um, but it's really important fruit as to why toxic chemicals are a bad thing and how they easily make it into humans. Yep, you had a question? Yeah, so um, since you were mentioning that um, the mercury and tuna comes from the food, in general, so is the level of mercury the same, like as high in other fishes as well, or is it just tuna? Um, it, so it's going to depend on, um, so, well, let me take a step back. So the big issue with mercury tuna was mercury as a pollutant. We've We've done a lot to regulate mercury as a pollutant since that happened. Um, so the levels have dropped over time. So I'll just, I'll just make mention that. So you, you can feel free to eat tuna. You're not going to die or, or anything like that if you like tuna. Um, but it depends on the size of the organism, right? How far up that food chain they are. So again, people eat herring. It's a common thing. But because they're so much smaller, it, they simply are getting a less concentrated dose than our friend the salmon here. So or in the case that we're talking about the tuna. So it's present in all the organisms if the chemicals in the environment. It just 
how big you are dictates how much food you have to eat, thus how much of the chemicals you're going to ingest. Is that clarifying? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. It's kind of a cool, th I mean, it's a scary thing when you think about it, but it's really a, just a really nice thing, right? It just accumulates over time. It accumulates the bigger you are. So if I'm a human and I'm hunting seals for sustenance, I got to worry about whatever contaminants the seal has been eaten in his food. So that's, um, that's bioaccumulation. It can affect your, your food. Um, it, it still does affect your food, just, just as an FYI. Um, it's just not mercury at the moment. <laughs> um, but you certainly get a big dose, right? That's why I showed you the credit card example, right? Now, the documentary is going to talk a lot more about um, sort of the effects of human health, especially through the lens of our, um, our uh, reproduction. So the big one is male fertility goes down um, as males consume more and more plastic. But let's talk about some other sort of effects. Now, we're going to talk about something that's actually really, really, really heavily uh, actively researched right now, because we really actually don't know the effects of plastics on human health. Now, plastics, when they were really put forth as this, as this really important thing was around, you know, around the 50s or so. Um, and they were, they were essentially as a game changer, right? And they, they have been ever since. And don't get me wrong, plastics have been super important for lots of things that humans have done, but simply plastics were just seen as an essential part of life and thus they were safe. And, and, we, and you know, they weren't really something that we needed to study. But as time has gone on and we learn more and more and more about the effects of plastic, we've done more and more research. So the things I'm gonna tell you now, there are, there are things we know and they're, they're correlations, but they're not like settled in stone at this point in time. They're not like, you know, like smoking causes cancer correlation. Like if you smoke, you're gonna get cancer, right? They're not that strong, but they're gonna be there one day. Or, or some way, shape, or form, they should be there one day. So let's talk about some of these things. Now, uh, when, when our plastics uh, have absorbed some of those persistent organic compounds, uh, you know, metals, um, you know, pesticides, you know, asbestos, things like that, uh, you can imagine that those things are not so great for humans, especially for small and humans, humans in the womb, right? Babies, things like that. So uh, plastics, you know, the things they, they, they like to grab onto, they have lots and lots of clinical bad things, right? Um, you know, we can look at Flint, Michigan as a great example, right? Lead in the water, lots of bad things have happened to the children there uh, in the fertility rates there as well. So um, definitely POPs are really, really bad things. And we know their medical effects and we know they can be carried by plastics. Thus, we should be worried about them. Now, we have these other groups um, of plastics. Now, they're called phthalates. I, can never, I think that's how you, I can never remember how to spell it. I think it's phthalates. That's probably wrong, but they're just simply called plasticizers. They, they make plastics more flexible, make them more durable. You can make plastics thinner because of them. Um, and, you know, for instance, like, um, you know, Coke bottles used to be thicker when they were plastic before phthalates were readily adopted because simply because they weren't strong enough. But adding phthalates, these plasticizers make Coke bottles thinner, which is a good and a bad thing, I guess. But what these phthalates are known for is actually to be endocrine disruptors. Now, for those of you that don't know what endocrines are, they're your hormones, right? We think about, you know, like testosterone and, and estrogen being the two big ones, but there's lots of hormones out there. And, you know, they, they range from things like such as adrenaline, um, melatonin, things like that. But hormones, um, for those of you that aren't super familiar with what hormones do, they're basically long distance messengers. And so, you know, they're produced in say your pituitary gland in your, in your testicles, uh, or just, I'll just say your, your gonads. Um, and they, they, they travel to other parts of your body and they, they cause changes in your development, cause changes in your body's behavior, again, as a long distance messenger. So hormones really control everything. That's sort of the bottom line. Now you can imagine if you, if you disrupt something, because these, these plastics, these thalates like to bind to, um, uh, uh, endocrine receptors on your body cells, thus making your endocrines not effective. Um, because they like to bind to those things, they affect all sorts of basic aspects of your biology, including affecting human growth, affecting your metabolism. You guys will see in the documentary, large effects on male fertility, like a lot, <laughs> like, like potentially cataclysmic in event. Um, but again, you'll see in the documentary, um, there's some pretty common, uh, pretty strong correlations between how much plastic a mother consumes while she's pregnant and um, uh, developmental disorders such as ADHD, autism. There's been some recent research about um, uh, exposure in the womb and um, premature birth as well. Um, but there's also some level of correlation between the exposure to these plasticizers and diabetes, 
insulin resistance, breast cancer, obesity, and the list actually goes on and on and on, unfortunately. So there's lots of things that have been linked to plastics. Again, not as strong as like smoking causes cancer, um, but certainly enough that we should be concerned. So for instance, my wife is pregnant um, with, we're pregnant, she's pregnant with her first child right now. And I've been a pretty, a uh, pretty big hound on her about trying to limit how much plastic she consumes um, by limiting how much what she drinks out of. And she hates me for it because she likes things in plastic bottles because, you know, there's tasty things uh, in plastic bottles. But I try to limit what she does, again, because of all these negative side effects. And, and, and so lots and lots of things are unknown at this time. We'll know a lot more in the future. But right now, we simply don't know. And it's not because... <laughs> Chippy! Um, not because we're trying, because we didn't want to know, it's just because they were such an important part of our culture. So lots of things. Now, you might think to yourself, okay, I'm not a fish. <laughs> Hopefully not a fish. Definitely not a fish, right? Uh, I'm not a fish. I'm not a whale. I'm not just eating plastics because they look like tasty things. So how do you get your credit card worth of plastic into your body every day? And the most common way is actually through what you drink. So when, there's actually a really interesting study uh, um, done by Forbes, as well as Statista, uh, pretty reliable. Um, I'm sure you guys probably know Forbes, you know, business people. They, but they do some pretty reliable research, pretty reliable stuff. Um, they had a really interesting study. You can find this. Uh, they looked at 259 bottles across all these co really common um, drink uh, brands, including our, our friends at Nestle, um, maybe something like uh, Aquafina from our friends at Pepsi, uh, Dasani from our friends at Coke, Evian, San Pellegrino, so on and so forth, and across a bunch of different countries as well. And you'll notice that they find plastic. So we can look at the concentration. So this is the number of microplastics found in the bottle. And you see Nestle leads the way, um, not surprising, where basically every Nestle bottle had plastic in it, but some Nestle bottles had over 10,000 pieces of plastic in them. Um, which is a lot. Um, and the average across all these brands, these huge, huge brands, which service billions of people every year, is about 325 pieces of plastic per year. Now, this number is just bottled water. If you drink Coke or any other bottled beverage, you get the same dose, sometimes a higher dose because, you know, seltzers and Cokes and, and beer and things like that, they're acidic. So they actually break down plastic faster. So Lots and lots of plastics making it in through your drinking water. Now, you might say, okay, maybe I don't use bottled water. How else do I get plastic in? Well, one of the other common ways is actually through your, your, your other consumption habits around drinking. And so you guys probably remember this from a couple of years ago. Um, our friend here, well, I guess our former friend, Tom Brady. I, I don't know. Does New England like Tom Brady anymore? I don't, I don't know. New England fans are weird. So we probably, I don't know. I should, I, should, I should ask one of my friends that knows, that knows uh, football better than I do. But our former or potentially current friend, whatever your feelings are, uh, Tom Brady, among many, many others, went on this sort of crusade against plastic straws, right? You guys probably remember this. Terrible pictures of straws and turtles and stuff like that. And there was this huge uproar and it got people to uh, make better plastic, you know, better straws, right? So like, for instance, I, uh, I live, I told you guys I live in Easton. I go to this ice cream place in the town over. I like, I like strawberry milkshakes. They're, they're, they're pretty awesome. Um, when I get my strawberry milkshake, it comes in a, you know, plastic cup, obviously, and it comes to the plastic lid, but they give me paper uh, straw which I'm all for, but as a note, paper straws are awful for milkshakes. So I actually have a metal straw here at my house when I get a milkshake from there, because again, milkshakes and, and, plastic and, and paper straws don't, don't go together. And you can't convince me otherwise. Now, that's one way. And um, you guys probably remember how big of a deal this was, right? It was a huge thing about all the plastics and, and, and so on and so forth. And the reality is plastic straws were actually not a big deal. Uh, globally speaking, there's only about 0.03% of all plastics. And I mean 0.03%. I don't mean like 3%. I mean 0.03% of all total plastic waste by mass is our friends, the straws. So it's actually not a super big deal in terms of total mass. It's certainly a plastic waste problem. Don't get me wrong. Um, but it actually started because uh, a nine-year-old girl, and she this was she wasn't doing this for any reason other than she was trying to write a term paper. Uh, she made the mistake of reporting about 500 million straws were consumed daily. That's actually simply not true. Um, it's about a tenth of that, which is still a lot of straws, but um, certainly not a uh, accurate statistic. Um, and so we got all up in roar about this, about the turtles, about the about the sea lions, and so on and so forth because of a false statistic. Um, however, 
not saying it was a bad thing. I'm glad everyone got upset about plastic straws. Every every biologist was like, yes, everybody get angry about plastics. Um, and I, I do mean that. And 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 uh, and they were and it was a good thing that people got upset about plastic, but then it quickly waned. Um, it really did. Um, because people just they saw the plastic problems and like, oh, I'm gonna change my straw habits. And then they completely ignored all the other problems with the plastic. But a lot of environmental organizations, such as the World Wildlife Foundation, actually see um, common, commonly see straws as gateway plastic. And, and I'm sure you guys have probably heard that idea of like a gateway drug, right? If you, tr you do this drug, it'll make you more likely to do other drugs. A lot of people see that gateway plastics, uh, that's, that the ban on straws or the, the cultural shift against straws might be this gateway plastic that gets people to rethink their relationship with plastic. Has it happened yet? No. Will it happen? I sure hope so. But at this point in time, it hasn't done all that much outside of get some people to switch to paper straws. It also got a whole group of people in the United States, um, for whatever reason, really upset that plastic straws were going away because they were taking away their freedoms. You, you guys, you guys probably remember all that stuff. It was really, really stupid um, at the time, but um, it didn't do too much for the plastic problem. But it did bring a spotlight to plastic, and a lot of people. And environmental people hope that it is a catalyst. Now, the, we saw this actually happen in the 90s. So again, before you guys were born, there's this whole big mess, whole angry group of people about uh, dolphins being trapped in tuna nets. Tuna is the, probably one of the most common fishes consumed in the United States. And as a byproduct of catching tuna in the wild, uh, we catch dolphins in our nets. And people love dolphins. They're very, very intelligent. They're, they're beautiful. They do cool stuff. Um, and people got really angry about dolphins being trapped in their nets. And so a whole industry had to make a shift away from catching dolphins in their nets to create dolphin safe tuna. Um, all tuna, sold in the United States at least, should be dolphin safe at this point in time. But again, it was a cultural shift against this practice of killing dolphins. And we don't, we haven't seen that happen yet, but we do hope that will happen at some point in time. So uh, we have straws and we have bottles of liquids. And we have lots of other things that have plastic in them. Remember, soda cans have plastic in them. As you drink from a reusable bottle, even if it's a nice, like good Nalgene, you're still getting plastic. So your drinks are one way plastic gets into you. Plastic, as you guys will also see, gets into tissue. You'll see that in the documentary. It gets into a tissue, accumulates in tissue. So if you eat beef, cow, chicken, um, it accumulates in plant tissue as well. If you eat all those things, you, you consume the, I was going to say the flesh, but you consume the tissue of organisms, either plants or non-plant, you're still consuming plastic. Because remember, plastics are everywhere. They're in the soil. And if in the soil is our plants, right? And they're absorbing these plastics into the roots, into their tissues, which we then consume. And then the final mechanism by which plastic makes it into you um, is actually um, not on this slide. Um, that's going to be the next thing we talk about. But the final way is actually in packaging. So with the way we package our food, wrapping it in plastic, um, plastic as it you know, wraps against wrapped in food, or you wrap food in it, or whatever, or you store food in it. Um, it gets plastic. You you essentially break plastic off that you know container or the wrapping, and it goes into your food. And the most common way this happens is actually by extreme temperatures. So really, really cold and really, really hot. So like below freezing, like freezer, and like say above fifty degrees, cause plastics to essentially break and leach into your food. So the moral of the story here is, there's pretty much nothing you can do to stop plastic from getting into you. However, you can try to limit how much plastic you get by limiting how much plastic touches your food, as well as by limiting how much plastic touches your drink. So that's, uh, that's, that's really it. But because again, regardless of what you do, plastic is so freaking persuasive in our society, it's going to make it to you some way, shape or form. And so it's not, it's not a lost cause, not a lost cause at all but it is something you can limit. So that's my spiel with that. Now let's talk about some businesses surrounding plastic because this is, you guys are Bentley students. You guys like money. Well, you guys like business. I'm sure you guys probably like money. Everyone, everyone likes money. The money is, 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 is certainly part of the key to happiness, right? As long as you have enough of it and you're not worried about paying your bills, money's, money's, a, money's a fantastic thing to help fulfill your happiness. So let's talk about some environment, uh, some issues, some um, uh capital ways to make money off this plastic problem uh, or potentially some nonprofit ways that to, to sort of tackle this problem. Now we'll talk about one that made the news uh, from uh, Boyan Slot. I'm sure that's probably not how you say it because he's Danish. Um, and for those of you that know anything about the Danish language, it is really hard. 
Um, so I'm probably sure it's probably not Boolean slide. It's probably something else because Danish is really, really hard. Um, but this, this young inventor um, started uh, Ocean Cleanup and is a nonprofit that was, that's helping develop technologies um, to help reduce oceanic plastic. Um, and the thing they were really concerned about was actually this great uh, Pacific garbage patch. Now you guys probably heard about this. Um, and we sort of saw this on our maps when we looked at oceanic currents. There's basically a giant current that circles the Pacific Ocean. And the Pacific Ocean, as you guys probably know, is the biggest piece of, of water on the entire planet. You could take all the continents of the planet and stuff it into the Pacific Ocean and still have room left over. That's how big the Pacific Ocean is, is massive. But in the center of the Pacific Ocean, we have what's called the Great Garbage Patch. You guys probably heard of it, it made the news a couple of years ago, it was a big deal. That's what his venture is trying to do, this garbage patch that's perpetually stuck in the center of the Pacific Ocean because of the oceanic currents. His, his little group is aiming to reduce the, the, great oceanic, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by about 90% by 2040. Um, and so they have this cool technology um, <clears throat> that um, essentially goes out there with an automation, cleans up um, all the garbage and stuff like that, and then you have to bring it back to get rid of the garbage, and then you send it out again. It's a pretty cool adventure. If you never heard of it, definitely Google a video of it. Um, it's a pretty, again, it's, it's a pretty cool piece of, engin uh, of engineering. It's pretty great uh, innovation. Uh, clearly, it's nonprofit, so it's not making money or really doing much to make profit off it, but it's certainly a good way to take a business idea, even if it's a nonprofit, and apply it to an environmental problem. However, um, as good as the stuff he's doing is, um, critics actually argue, and you guys probably should have an idea of this uh, based on our numbers earlier, is that that's simply not gonna solve the plastic problem, right? We know that 80% of the plastic in the ocean comes from rivers, right? So if, if the ocean, the, while the, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is awful, if we wanna solve the plastic problem in the ocean, we need to tackle the rivers. Um, and so you can sort of see this, um, sort of the, the, what he's doing here, right? All this garbage in the ocean, all the plastics, um, trying to clean up that mess. Um, and you can sort of see this cool YouTube video um, about tackling rivers. It's, I think it's pretty fun. Uh, I think it's like six minutes. You can take a peek at it when you have a chance about trying to tackle the plastic problems through tackling rivers. And then um, the sort of the final, uh, I'm sorry, the, the final thing I'd like to make mention of is actually an, a really cool company. Um, I see... Um, I see bumper stickers for this company um, when I go to Petco for whatever reason, just, just, just that area of Petco near me. Um, and uh, it's for a company called Four Ocean, and they make plastic bracelets out of recycled plastic trash and fishing netting. And so, you know, they're clearly not for everyone. I, I know I, you know, this is more of like a, I don't know, I feel like a surfer would like this type of plastic, uh, type, of, type of jewelry, or, or maybe, a, maybe someone that doesn't like fancy jewelry, but um, they take plastic a commodity that doesn't, we don't do a great job recycling and we'll, we'll talk about that next, um, next week, but they make money off of it. And I like this quote from the founder, Andrew Cooper. He says, as a for-profit business, we're able to give ocean trash a monetary value <clears throat> and incentivize people all over the world to change their behavior. That's how we clean the ocean and drive the actions and policies that will prevent trash from entering the ocean in the first place. So he's taking trash out of the ocean. Good thing. Makes money off it. Good thing for him and obviously for the taxes he pays for and you know people that use the tax money um but also potentially saying hey here's this guy he's making money off plastic maybe i can also carve out a niche so there is a lot of opportunities economically of trying to use oceanic trash um and just plastic in general just just as a note uh, there's lots of opportunities available out there for people to capitalize on so if you're trying to find a cool business venture um, I think dog photography would be the, like a dog photography studio would still be the best <laughs> adventure to take because people are crazy about their dogs. However, plastic waste is certainly a big avenue that's open. And now you might ask yourself, why isn't it more heavily commodi uh, commodified? There we go. It's simply because buying brand new plastic is easier than recycling plastic. That's the sort of place we're at right now. Our plastic, our waste management system is awful, especially here in the United States. So we'll talk about that next week. Um, but I just wanted to foreshadow of, of why more people don't do this because again, from a, from a from a commercial standpoint, it's easier just to buy brand new plastic than to recycle plastic. So, all right. So this brings us to our sort of final slides for the day: is what is Bentley doing now? Um, I've taught at a lot of places across Boston. I've taught at BU. I've taught at Northeastern, Bentley, UMass Boston, and the list kind of goes on till I I'm, I hit about fifty percent of all colleges and, and um, universities in the Boston area. I've taught at a lot of places in the Boston area. Um, 
And I've taught a lot of classes. However, I will say of all the places I have taught in Boston, Bentley does the best job. Bentley has the best sustainability profile of any school in the entire Boston area. So you guys should pat yourself on the back. Um, I know you guys didn't really do anything for it, but as a campus, Bentley does fantastic. It really, really does. Now, you guys, uh, if you've never been on Bentley's campus, because um, you know you might be taking this as a freshman, so you might, because of COVID, you might never have made it to campus. Uh, Bentley has single stream recycling. So you don't need to sort your plastics from your metals, from your papers or anything like that. You throw it all in one bin and it's great. However, there are some exceptions here. Now, Bentley doesn't handle number six plastic. So you guys probably know when you turn over a plastic thing, uh, you know, it has a, a number in, um, in, in um, like a little triangle. Uh, that's, the that's the recyclable number. We won't really talk about it, but um, it, um, it simply refers to the type of plastic. Thus, you know, if you're, you're, your recycling facility can handle that plastic or not, it's depending upon what type of plastic it is. And so depending on your recycling facility, it takes some types of plastics, you know, some numbers. Um, others don't. Now, the company that Bentley hires, uh, they don't take number six. So if you guys are having fun with red solo cups, for whatever reason that might be, whatever reason, those aren't recyclable. So just as a note, if you guys have red solo cups, um, uh, don't throw those in the recycling at Bentley because um, you're totally doing not terrible. You're not doing um, any fun things with those red solo cups at all. Uh, but make sure they end up in the regular trash, not the recycling. And then the big thing, especially with Bentley, not just with Bentley, I should say with all recyclability, it's actually um, contamination. You want to make sure when you toss that piece of recyclable material into your garbage can to be recycled, it's clean. And so when you throw stuff away at Bentley, when you throw stuff away at your house, give it a quick rinse. Try to make sure there's not as much food on there uh, because you're trying not to contaminate the plastic. Because what happens a lot of times when these plastics make it to um, when these plastics make it to the to the um, uh, recycling. Uh, facility, they see there's a Starbucks cup in there and your, your caramel latte is spilled all over the plastic. A lot of the times they'll say, well, that's too dirty. And they'll throw that bag of trash, that plastic that could be recyclable into the landfill, thus contributing to the plastic problem. So moral of the story is guys do great. No number six cups and wash your stuff off before you do it. So dump your Starbucks out, wash it out, throw it away. But again, Bentley does a pretty good job. Pat yourself on the back. Now, what can you do? Um, as I sort of already foreshadowed, it's really hard to get rid of plastic. Pick up your cell phone. The case, it's probably, well, hopefully you put your cell phone in the case, given how expensive phones are nowadays. Uh, it probably has plastic in it. You, you know, most cases are made of plastic or rubber, which usually has plastic in it. Your phone itself, the, a lot of the components inside have plastic. If you're like me and you have a screen protector because you're a big klutz with your phone, <laughs> um, it's made of plastic, right? You pick up, I, you know, I have... Um, I have, some, I have, a, I have a, some pens next to me, all plastic. I have a notebook next to me, paper with plastic in it. So you look at your car, you look at your laptop, plastic, plastic, plastic. So plastic is a problem that is super duper pervasive. <laughs> super duper pervasive. So what can you do outside of the, the inescapable problem of plastic? Well, the reality is just trying to limit Right, trying to limit how much plastic you use, right? So trying to get rid of less bio, try to use less single-use plastic as best you can. You know, you know, it's not not such a you know using one every now and then. It's not such a big deal, but again, trying to limit that because again, that's the big problem. That single-use plastic. If you're a smoker, try to make sure you don't throw your cigarette butts out into the environment because again, puts lots of plastic into the environment. Um, you know, certain th other things that you could think about doing is like, you know, those reusable bags are great, right? So you don't use single use bags, a good water bottle, maybe a metal one, you know, good, like, you know, the, the cheap metal water bottles taste awful, but a good metal water bottle limits how much plastic you drink, how much plastic makes in the environment. So that's definitely a good way to do. Uh, and the other thing I'll make mention of is actually how much you wash your clothes and the types of clothes you buy. Um, try to limit how much you wash your clothes as best you can. Um, you know, I know it's hard to do with shirts because, you know, people got stinky armpits and stinky backs and all that stuff um, and underwear too, obviously, because of the, the butt problem. Um, but, you know, trying to limit how much you wash your yoga pants and stuff like that and your jeans, uh, again, limits how much plastics. Um, and then when you're buying food, try to limit um, the, your food wrapped in plastic as best you can. It's really, really hard. I went, I went grocery shopping yesterday and I was buying some, uh, some meat to, to grill. Um, so for, to make burgers and, and, and stuff like that. And it was all wrapped in plastic. I couldn't find a single thing not wrapped in plastic. Even if I went to the butcher, he would wrap my meat in plastic as well. So or he or she. Um, so it's, it's kind of an inescapable thing. 
So, um, but again, you can try to limit it as best you can. So let's talk about um, some cool research before we sorry break for the day. Um, so someone already spoiled my my thing, but um, this these brand new bacteria and fungi um, actually been engineered and to break down plastic, and so they do a process called biodeterioration, which is sort of the actual decomposition of plastic. So what these microbes do is they form what's called a biofilm. Now you guys all know what a biofilm is. You just didn't know it was called a biofilm. So I'm sure you guys have probably like, you know, woken up in the morning, brushed your teeth, hopped out, and you went out all day and you came back home at night. And you're all tired. And you're like, oh, I should go brush my teeth. And you kind of like run your tongue over your teeth and it feels kind of grimy, like um, like gross, you know, like there's stuff on it. Or maybe uh, another example I'll give you is maybe you've gone hiking and you've gone into a stream or a river and you've stepped on a rock and it was super slippery and you slipped out and you crashed on your bum. Like I, I've done that a bajillion times because I'm very not coordinated at all. What caused your mouth to be gross and grimy and what caused that rock to be slippery is what's called a biofilm. It's just a bunch of bacteria growing on top of one another. That's all a biofilm is. Bacteria like to grow on that. Uh, those are sort of harmless examples. I'll just make mention uh, when you get a lung infection, like a bacterial infection, like pneumonia, like a bacterial pneumonia, biofilms are what make pneumonia really dangerous. Just, just as a note. Now, these bacteria form biofilms on top of these plastics. They use some cool enzymes that have been genetically engineered to be stuck in their side of their genomes. They break it down, getting some energy from it and producing CO2. So getting rid of the plastic. Now, that sounds awesome, right? And I told you about there's, there's worms that have been engineered too, but that doesn't solve the problem of the plastic in the environment, right? Because um, there's lots of plastic in the environment. And there's none of these bacteria exist in the environment. And so we'd have to stick these bacteria or worms or fungi into the environment. And that we're not really there yet. Um, it's, and we, don't, we wouldn't really know the effects of introducing a, a, a bacteria like that into the environment. So we're not quite there yet, but maybe it's a good avenue for our waste, for our, 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 like our plants, right? Our, our waste plants. Maybe that's a good avenue for that. Um, so that's a, it's a cool little thing. Um, uh, some pretty cool, um, research um actually and there's uh these came out recently within the past year and there's actually a new one that came out that actually um um here uh that's related to this one is that um when they actually studied um microplastics in six thousand people you can read about it they found um, microplastics in every single human tissue that was studied it was every piece of tissue it was really amazing so they found plastic in every single piece of human tissue in this very large study and in another actually really large study i, I didn't link it here but if anyone's interested i can send it to you they actually found um microplastics inside of the placenta so they were able to cross the placental barrier from the mother to the child, which, as I mentioned, the things that stick to plastic are cause the most harm to the young right, and the unborn. So humans, we like our plastics. It's everywhere. Now, interestingly, uh, sort of related to uh, fetal plastics is actually baby plastics. Now, um, we looked at uh, this really cool study that actually looked at um, a, a single brand of bottle of baby bottle that actually has 82% of the global market share. And they actually found that just by looking at this one single bottle, that infants were actually consuming about 1.5 million pieces of plastic, microplastics, of course, daily via their bottle feed. So um, lots of problems in adults, as well as in the unborn. And then our babies are consuming lots and lots of plastic. So. Um, and there's there's a lot of research on this. I, I just picked these ones because I thought they were the, the most like uh, hot button out there, <laughs> um, which is, um, you know, people are always concerned about babies, of course. Um, uh, but really just wacky and wild, um, not really wacky, but just really wild just effects of plastic on human biology. And there's more and more research coming out every single day about this. And it, it's truly remarkable how pervasive plastic is in our um uh, in our tissues, in our lives, in our biology. So uh, with that, that's going to be the end of today's talk. Now, I have another optional discussion board for you guys. You, again, it's completely optional. You don't have to do it. But if something I said piqued your interest, like maybe this piqued your interest, or maybe this piqued your interest, or maybe this piqued your interest, or maybe Four Ocean piqued your interest, or maybe the, the video piqued your interest, any, if any piece of media or any idea really, really piqued your, your interest, um, hop onto the discussion board. I'll create it in after this class is over um, and give me a, you know, a summary. What did you learn? 
And what are your thoughts about it? What, what, or what was some question you had when you're reading it? Or was something that made you angry, something that made you sad, or something you were like, whoa. Um, so again, another optional discussion board. Again, you don't, you're not going to get graded. Uh, you don't have to do it at all. But if something, you know, if something's on your mind about this plastic, about one of these articles, definitely let me know. Um, again, I'll create the discussion board after, um, after class is finished today. So. But with that, um, that's actually going to be the end of today's class. So um, if you guys have any questions, I will hang around for a little bit, as always. And you clearly can obviously reach me on uh, email because, you know, email is fun. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you guys have a good day. I will see you on Friday and we'll be talking about climate change. So get prepared for a, for a long one because <laughs> it, it is. So anyways, I'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor.